Gerard, you weren't here, right? Okay, we taught on the kingdom last week, and uh, we we're trying to teach on four things uh, this upcoming month, and that was the kingdom, the law of the kingdom, the culture of the kingdom, and the gospel of the kingdom. And when uh, Elder Wallace gets back, he doesn't know, but he's going to be teaching on some of this. <clears throat> They're up in Alabama this week. So just pray for them, traveling mercies. Uh, I, I mean, I did today, but just continue to pray for them. The Lord bless them. And they can come back and share some really cool stuff with us. Uh, I want to talk about the culture of the kingdom. Y'all realize every kingdom has a culture, right? Amen. Right? All right. Some of y'all have seen this, this lesson. I added to it last night. And then when I woke up this morning, got here, I was at 2%. I don't know how it happened. And uh, we had to run back and get all this. But if you have your Bibles, or you don't even need it, really. Everything's going to be up here. Um, next slide. Next. Oh, man, I don't know. Can you all see that where you're sitting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, before we even go this route, I'm going to ask you guys to keep an open mind. Okay? This is going to be a little crazy. But nonetheless, I think it will make sense when it's all said and done. 2 Corinthians 6.16 and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. Says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, if you can go to the... Uh, we're going to play the old guessing game. Can somebody guess what culture this is? This kind of clothing. China. China. Japanese. Japanese. That's Chinese all the way. That's Chinese. I'm going to go with Birch on this one. I think he's had a... Why do you say that? Probably the Chinese dragon on the front of the... Okay. The one. Chinese culture. All right. You ever see somebody wearing this, you know what they're representing. Next one. What culture is this? Yeah. Okay. Good one. I ain't arguing that. Yep. What about this one? Irish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if you go over there, this is pretty common. This is this is normal in that culture. Amen. Mm -hmm. Next one. Next one. Mexico. 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 Oh, same thing. I'm going to say Mexican. Yeah, we got some bread. That thing's banging. <laughs> what about the next one? What about that one? All right. Yeah. Jewish. That's right. <laughs> yep. What about this one? Probably India. I know. Between Mexico and India, they've got the most colors. I mean, they really like it bright, man. They get with it. I'm gonna, it's India. So when you see people wearing this stuff, you can kind of tell what culture they're of, right? Yeah. Okay, well, God's kingdom has a, has a culture. And it also has a dress code. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 22.5. The woman shall not wear that which pertains unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment... For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now there's some speculation on what this really means. Because what culture are we going by? Whose culture and at what time period? I mean, because it's, it's going to be subject to the, this time period when this scripture was wrote. We all need to still be wearing robes. And that's just crazy. We just don't do that. And the Lord is, he knows what he's doing. He's not bound by time or culture. Can you all agree with that? Mm -hmm. But I will break this scripture down for you in uh, the United Pentecostal Church, which I, church I got saved in, uh, will teach you that a woman should always wear either dresses or skirts. And I'm cool with that. I, I don't think you... Lord, help me to teach us right. <clears throat> And that a woman cannot put on pants whatsoever because pants are a man's garment and vice versa. I will say this. Do y'all agree that a man should not shop in the women's section when they go shopping, right? Do 
Can y'all agree that a woman should not be in the man section? Unless you're together. Well, unless you're together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, unless she's shopping for you. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. Now, there are, you know, these are manly pants. But you can tell when the when a pair of slacks is for a woman or a man, right? right? It's kind of right. obvious to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am going to break down the Hebrew words for this before we get going. Pertaineth unto. Anybody got the? Uh, I'll pull it up. I want y'all to see this? This is pretty cool. <clears throat> that way, you guys know. I, I wish I'd put it up here on my Deuteronomy. It is the Hebrew word kali in its uh, age, the Hebrew word 3615 in the Strong's Concordance, an apparatus, a vessel, or a weapon unto a man. That word man is not just any man. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is a warrior. It's not Adam, meaning human race. Adam, what we would say Adam. Man. It is a totally different Hebrew word, and it's for a warrior. So think about this. A woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. In other words, now mind you, an apparatus, a vessel, a weapon, the weapon of a warrior, and go and play a man's job. This is why in Israel today, can you get back to where we were? Okay. This is why in Israel today, uh, y'all know the... Uh, the teens, when they come out of high school, mom, they got to serve two years in the military. It's automatic. Right. Boy, girls and boys, when they right. come out of high school, they have to serve two years in Israel. And the rabbinics, the Jews, though they don't have Messiah, they still have the word. And they're, they say it's an abomination for the girls to be joined in the army because of this scripture right here. And they're using it in its context. I'm sorry, God never did intend a woman to de defend a man, but vice versa. Right. The man was supposed to be the protector, am I right? Right. Mm -hmm. Not the other way around. We, you know, every now and then you might see that in relationships <laughs> where homegirl does look like she'll put her man on his back. <laughs> <laughs> but God never intended my wife to protect me. Now you imagine these women going to war back in the day with swords and spears. And a thousand, like 50,000 women running after 50,000 men of the enemy. While the men are at home doing whatever, I don't know, burping babies. That's not how it worked. God, it's just at this point you are getting away from what God intended. However, it does say, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. So there shouldn't be a difference between a man and a woman. 100%. Mama... You look very feminine to me today. You do too. You do too. <clears throat> but if you catch yourself in the men's section of a store, you need to check yourself. I'm just going to be real. I'm sorry. This Amen. is the word. Yes. All right? Amen. There needs to be separation. Birch, if I ever catch you in the female section shopping, we got problems. Mm -hmm. All right. I, <laughs> If you find me there, it'll be my turn. <laughs> 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 Standing next to his wife, right. Next slide if you could. Oh, man. Here's another one. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair, gold, and pearls, costly array. Oh, boy. And this is another one that we've been taught. Uh, we need to be modest. We'll wear... Shirts to our wrists, uh, the necks, up to the neck. We'll wear skirts this, in Pentecost. I'm talking about Pentecost. This is how I grew up. And it's got to be below the knees. Okay, I'm cool with that. I don't think women should be showing off too much leg. How, can y'all agree with this? Men already have a problem, a default that God made us a certain way. We're, we're visual. We don't need ladies' help. It's bad enough. Okay, and not only that, but women should not be promoting themselves in this manner. Guess what you're attracting? If a lady's showing off a bunch of bodies, she knows what she's doing. What is she trying to attract? Felicia, what is she trying to attract? Um, attention, love. All right. She wants men to look at them, right? Mm -hmm. Guys do this stuff too. They want men to look like that. 
Men want women to look at them too. It's just a natural thing. But listen, your body belongs to your significant other. Yeah, it belongs to your body. It's not. It's, you need to save the private parts and all that other stuff for your husband. You should not be showing off our bodies. That's so true. Trust me, there's a lot of time I just want to get out there and get a sunburn or something because my skin needs it. I want to mow the lawn in my tank top, but I don't do it. Okay? I don't need my neighbors falling over head, you know, head over heels for these biceps. <laughs> BB guns. Yeah, right? <laughs> the gun show. The BB gun show. But there, there should be some modesty here. Now, I get it. We've all got a different idea of what modesty is. But I'm just going to say it like this. What culture is God being bound to? And if we're going to let the times define what, what <laughs> oh boy, what modesty is, because as time goes on, the more immodest this nation gets. And if it ain't because it was Daisy Dukes back in the 70s, now it's these yoga pants where you can see literally everything. It leaves nothing to the imagination. I don't know. The skin don't need to be shown for it to be immodest. Y'all agree with this? Right. Yeah. Am I on my own here? No. Okay. <clears throat> uh, immodest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Here's what that's saying. Women, do not throw yourselves out there. There is a... What this is talking about is to, it's an attitude issue. You ever seen the girls, and I say this when I, when I teach this, uh... Say in the club or at a, a house party. They come banging through the door with a glass. Ah! They're just out on Front Street. That is not how a woman of God should act. There needs to be some composure. Not throwing herself out there. It's weird. Have you ever watched, and I, and I ain't saying this to judge, but you can tell when somebody's on drugs walking the street. Yeah. The, the body language, they're everywhere. And you're like, the women, I hate to say it, but when you drive down here near US one, certain areas, and you see a lady walking, the body language gives her away. Okay? The Lord expects us to have some body language, especially the women. Should kind of not be all crazy. That's what that's part saying. Not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but rather with a meek and quiet spirit. The scriptures are not against those things. The Lord's not against you braiding your hair or gold or pearls or costly array. you got to do all things in moderation. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think we should use wisdom when it comes to the costly array. If you know you got people, brothers and sisters, that are in need, and you're out there buying $1,000 pants, there's a problem, man. Come on, right? Amen. we got to use some wisdom. So I do believe in modesty. My idea of modesty, we could probably sit here and argue with. But I don't think a woman should be showing off much of her legs. Much of the upper body. Keep your cleavage to yourself. I'm just, I'm just going to say it the way we ought to say it here. We're grown adults. I don't think a woman should be advertising some things, right? Can y'all agree with this? Amen. All right. Good. Amen. Next. <clears throat> First Corinthians 11, 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, is a shame unto him? First Corinthians eleven fifteen. 15. But if a woman has long hair, it is her uh, it is a glory to her, for it is for her hair is given. Her for a covering. What's the definition of long? Now this Greek word long here means to put in trestles. In other words, you can you can grab it and put it in a, at least at a minimum a ponytail. That's what a trestle is. Or at least in this Greek definition. So if a man has hair, and this is why the high priest would pull their hair, it's called pulling. They would Grab their hair, whatever was in that hand, snip, they drop it. And it would fall somewhere, maybe around here, I don't know. And they would let it grow for a year. And they would pull their hair once a year because they didn't want to violate. Because, I'm just going to say, there is no law against it. This is Paul's. Notice he says, does not nature even teach you this? You want to know why he had to say nature? Because there is no law in the only scriptures he has to teach from. 
do have a little bit of a conflicting thing in my head with that because I mean, Samson took a uh, Nazarite vow, right? And he was right about to razor to his head, right? So, <laughs> could a razor to his head mean he couldn't shave? But he could take a razor to his hair, head and hair. Difference. I don't know. I don't know. It seems to me he did have seven locks, so we know he had seven dreads. <laughs> so what the scripture says, Ezekiel, he said, the Lord picked me up. I was out by the river Chebar, and the Lord grabbed me by one of my locks. That's what he says. So, and not only that, but long hair, also in the trestle, in the situation, this is, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a shame unto him. It's not only worn in tresses. Imagine a man wearing his hair up, up yeah. all feminine. Yeah. Can you imagine seeing that? The way some women do? You Google images, women with their hair up. You'll see a lot of cool hairdos, right? You imagine a man running around with a beehive? Yeah. That's just crazy. That would look crazy on a man. See, I, I've i looked at this. I mean, this is my interpretation. It, you know, because when it says, does nature even teach itself? There are a lot of animals that have long hair. True. Uh, I'm telling you, there's just a lot of them. The thing is, me, is when I got this, my understanding of this is what you're talking about, up in a bun or something like that. Right. How you wear it. How you wear it. Right. To me, that's, that's my interpretation. And that could very well be it. I'll just say this. That obviously, if a man is going to have long hair, long enough to be pulled back into a trestle, into a ponytail or whatever, he's not to wear it up in a feminine hairdo. Right. Look it up. It's the Greek. I'm not making this up. You can look it up in the, in the Strong's Concordance. But if a woman has long hair, and I'm gonna, I keep going back to the polling because it's long enough to actually grab and pull. It is, it is her, uh, a glory to her for her hair is given her for a covering. Okay, I will say this: if a <laughs> hey, Papa, you're balding, huh? You balded a little bit over over the years. Not really. <laughs> She disagrees. I'm going with her. <laughs> Brother Jeff, you bought it over the years? You, you receded over the years, right? Yeah. The men did. Yeah. Right? How come you don't see women receding? Because God didn't intend a woman to have some hair. And I'm going to be honest with you. When you see the long hair on a woman, it's beautiful. Right. Okay. This is just a natural teaching of the Lord. I don't find it anywhere in the law. The only scriptures these men had, nowhere does it demand it. But however, the way God made you, men that have facial hair, women, 90 years old, still ain't received. I mean, they may lose a little bit of hair, but they don't bald like men. You can tell by the way God made us what he intended. Okay? I will say this. God intended it. He did not demand it. All right? I'm safe saying that, Lord. I'm fine here. I've been trembling before the Lord. I don't want to teach you guys something wrong. Okay? I know I have a responsibility here. I can tell you this for a fact. The Lord intended women to have longer hair. Okay? And the way God made you, men, all right. <clears throat> but listen, he doesn't demand it. Right. He doesn't demand a man that a shave or grow a beard. Doesn't demand a woman grows her hair long or cuts it. It's just natural. You can tell by what God intends. So I say it like this. If you have a heart of the bride right. and you want to please your husband, you're just going to do it. That's all that's it. What do you want to say, bro? There, there are some cultures that their women can't grow their hair long. I mean, they grow, it grows out to a certain point. True. But it doesn't grow long. Like, you know, right. every culture is different. Every you know, there's some yeah, these Indian women, they seem to grow hair almost overnight, man. Yeah. I don't know what's this. It's, it's, it's in genes, too. I, I get it. All right, next one. We're going to talk about food. Y'all picked the wrong day to come. <laughs> yeah. Food. Next one. Oh, boy. Fish. Next one. Um, Just leave it up there. Heavy. Fire. What culture is that? In 
Richters. <laughs> I think Mama was right. It was Indian. I'm pretty sure it was. Next one. What about that one? That one's African. No. What the white one is like, Pansa? Who? That white thing. Good question. What kind of food is that? Probably a dumpling or a ball of mozzarella. It was a mozzarella there. Next one. What about this one? This one's getting easy now. Oh, that's Irish. 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 Yeah, that's Irish. The rye bread? No, that's corned oh, beef. That's corned beef. Corned beef, corn beef and cabbage. cabbage. Corn beef. Oh, oh, yeah. Make O'Malley's, baby. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. All right. Excellent. What about that one? Chinese. Chinese. Yeah, okay. I get it. Yeah. Chinese. Chinese. Excellent. Italian. One of my favorites. Come on. Papa. Come on, man. This is my, one of my favorites. Lasagna. Woo! Oh, boy. What about this? I'm going to say Jewish. It's a quiche. Quiche? What is that? Jewish? I don't know. A quiche? You ever made a quiche? No. No? It's like an egg pie kind of thing. They mix spinach and other things in with it and make like a pie out of it. It doesn't look like egg though. That looks oh, it like would be in it. it would, yeah, it looks like a lot of spinach. It looks like a lot of bread. Oh, that's five though on the outside. Next one. Come on now. That's good. That's good. Woo! I was there yesterday, boy. Taco Tuesday. Go back, go back. <coughs> Y'all hungry yet? Get in my belly. Okay, so here's the thing. You can tell by the way a person dresses, things they eat, what culture they've been influenced by or represent. So if you catch me wearing a sombrero, eating burritos on Cinco de Mayo, you know what culture I'm all about at that moment, okay? And there's not to say there's a right and wrong when it comes to culture. But I will say when it comes to holidays, and we're going to touch on this, not all holidays are pagan. But the holidays that stem from false worship are right. Okay, we celebrate Independence. Uh, you know, as a, as this country, Fourth of July. What's so pagan about that? We broke away from a very tyrannical religious government of England, which was thrashing people if they weren't Catholic, and we broke away from it for religious liberty. So that we can worship and, and read the word of God freely. You know when schools, when, when we were established in this nation, if there was a village of 50 plus people, they had to have a school. And in that school, the main thing that was, that was taught for reading material was the Bible. So that we could learn the word of God and finally read it for ourselves. Instead of having a government breathing over. So when we celebrate the 4th of July, there's nothing pagan about that. No, it isn't. Okay, it's a beautiful thing. You know? Amen. Okay, so next. Now this is where it's going to get crazy. Y'all got your Bibles out? <coughs> yep, y'all picked the wrong day. No, but I will... Say this. <laughs> well, well, we'll get to it. Everybody there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we're there. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. And upon every fowl of the air. If you notice, even big animals, when they see humans, they're sketchy. They're kind of standoffish. You know what I mean? Maybe except the hungry grizzly bear, but but for the most part, yeah, this is true. All this, you know, all the animals of the earth dread. Uh, <clears throat> where am I at here? In the shadow of the dread of you, beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that move upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every watch this. Every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you. <laughs> Even as the green herb have I given you all things. The backdrop of this, the flood just happened. They're finally coming off the ark after a year being stuck on there with a bunch of crazy animals. I can't imagine the smell. How crazy these animals are going on that ark. 
you know, rocking around, and, and they finally get to come out. Like, oh man, no wonder why Noah. Noah, first thing he did was plant a vineyard and try to get his wine right, bro. <laughs> Anybody needed a drink, it was Noah. But, and the Lord's trying to tell him, listen, you're good to go. I've given you every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you, even as a green herb have I given you all things. Let me ask you guys something. Was there a such thing as a clean animal and an unclean animal at this point? Yeah, you can put them on your heart. There's clean and unclean. Yeah. Two pairs. you got to read this close. We always say it was two of unclean, seven clean. But it was pairs. Read it close. So that's four unclean and 14 clean animals that were they went in two by two, yes. But we get that a little mixed up, all the, uh, you got to read that closer. My dad pointed that out to me, and I just, I overlooked it for so many years. Did God just tell Noah to eat a dart frog and poison ivy? He said all moving things, right? We should just be taking God at his word at this point. You said everything. You give us all green herbs, too. I should be able to eat poison out. Good luck with that. And good luck eating a dart frog because you'll die when you touch it. They're that poisonous. Am I right? Some of them are so poisonous to the touch you can kill you. It's if the poison gets in your mouth or in your system. That's it. If you're not just going to touch it, it will. I don't think the Lord intended Noah and his family to eat dart frogs. And I don't think the Lord intended... Noah and his family eat poison ivy. Hang on a nice little salad. Let's sprinkle some poison ivy on it. <laughs> so, listen. At this point, Noah knew what a clean and an unclean animal was, number one. Number two, when these guys got on the ark, eight people and all these animals, for a year, bro, the Lord had to take care of their food situation for a year. And then when they got off the ark, what were they going to eat? What are they going to eat? There's no, the, all the animals are chilling with them. What vegetation? It just, just all got ruined. So whatever's on that ark that's coming off with them, that's their food supply, and the Lord knew ahead of time, I'm going to have to take care of your food supply. Here's your clean animals. Every Now listen, this is the law. You read it in Leviticus. If an animal has died, and it is not moving, it is not living, you are not to touch it. You are definitely not to eat it. So when we read every moving thing that lives, not just every thing that's moving on the earth, I'm pretty sure the Lord is very clear about what's clean and unclean at this point. And eventually the law that you're not supposed to eat something that's died, which is what the Lord is saying here. Okay? And if we move on, uh, okay, let's read this. God made certain animals for certain purposes. Did that change, or are mules still intended to haul and be a beast of burden? Did the purpose of a vulture, clams, shrimp, oysters, lobsters, being put, being created as nature's cleanup crew? That's why God made them. Y'all understand that? Yep. Did that intention ever change? They're still serving their purpose as nature's cleanup crew. Mules, camels are still serving their purpose to this day why God made them. Well, what about clean animals that God intended for food and sacrifice? Now, apart from sacrifice, when did that change? When did the intention of an animal change? Right? We know for sure God did not intend you to eat some jellyfish. Because they will kill you. Or a dark frog. You handle it, it gets into your system, you're a dead man. He said he gave you every moving thing, just like he gave you every green herb. And the Lord did not give us every green herb to eat. Period. It's just a fact. Within the guidelines, yes, of clean and unclean, you're not to all that's moving and living, yeah. We'll get there. I'm adding a little bit here. But I'm safe because I've got more word to back this. 
<clears throat> and we're back to Y14 of every clean beast. Because the Lord was trying to take care of their food situation when they got off the ark. Let's just say, Noah and his family were like, you know what? The hind legs on these two male horses look like they would be a beast. Put some barbecue sauce on that. Let's just cook two of the male horses. Imagine if they did that, that ate them into an extinction. But he did supply enough clean animals to do it. Okay? <clears throat> At some point, we've got to use a little common sense. Mm -hmm. God does not change. Genesis 9-4. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. In Acts 15-20, we see a God who does not change. Here they are reiterating the same thing. He told Noah this. You're not to eat animals with the lifeblood still in it. In other words, when you, you bro, break this down. You were a butcher. Break it down for me. Well, when you, the when difference you between how you gotta let the, you actually when you when you kill it, you drain it. Right. Let all the blood drain out. Right. Usually you hang it in the old days when I grew up on a farm is like a pig or whatever. You you cut its throat, hang it up, let all the blood drip out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you take it, put it in the refrigerator. Then you start breaking it down. Gotcha. Or you, a lot of times you can break it down in the field. Right. Now in paganism, a lot of different cultures, kind of just like savage. I mean, they would grab the hearts of animals, bite into them, blood all over their face. It's like, what are you doing? And most likely these people were into drinking the blood. I mean, this went on in, in, in Greeks. Oh, especially the Greeks, man. They were huge on this kind of stuff. In, in their false worship system. They didn't drain blood out right, man. There's a lot of people that did this, but the Lord had to tell his people, I don't want you doing what these jokers do. This is nuts. Never intended you to do this. But watch this. So the Lord's telling Noah roughly 4,000 years ago, and then roughly 2,000 years later in the book of Acts, uh, 1520, instead we should write to them, speaking to the Gentiles, there was a big argument over circumcision, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. So here you see something the Lord told Noah not to do, all the way in the book of Acts. I'm inclined to believe that God does not change, and he's not lying when he says it. Okay? God intended certain things that serve certain purposes. Next one, Malachi 3.16. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Next one. Leviticus 20.25. 20, you shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean. And you shall not make your souls abominable by beast, by beast or by fowl, or by any manner of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. Deuteronomy 14.3 Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. When you go through this list, uh, it calls things like uh, pigs, all that kind of stuff. They're unclean. If it's a bird or a land animal, they call it unclean for some reason. But when it comes to sea creatures that are unclean. It's abominable. Okay? I don't know why. I don't know why they just didn't say it was unclean. To me, I imagine it's all about the same thing. But there is a distinction there. So my point is this. People say, well, I can just about prove to you that there was, there's always been a law from Adam. Right. Gerard, when he, when, when Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices, how in the world did Abel know to sacrifice a clean animal? Right. Don't you think the Lord would have straightened him out if he had offered an unclean animal? Well, why not? Now the lesson begins. Here goes the law. Here's why. The first thing Adam learned about his God was the Sabbath. Keeping a Sabbath. God made man on the sixth day. Seventh day he rested. First thing Adam learned about God, he rested on the Sabbath. Hmm. There was clean and unclean. No one knew what clean and unclean was before we ever had it written down. 
There's always been a law. Abraham knew what clean and unclean was before it was ever written down. How did Abraham know to do a proper sacrifice? With what woods? Where to cut? How to cut? It doesn't even show up until we get to Leviticus. So there's always been a law at play. It just was not written down. Okay? They've always known this. This has just been common knowledge to the ancient world. Especially to those that were worship or in covenant with the Lord. Deuteronomy 4.2 You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Okay? I'm reminded of a story in the New Testament. Um, the Pharisees come up to Jesus and say, How come your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat? Transgressing the tradition of the elders. You want to know the Lord's response was, Well, why do you, with your tradition, transgress the law? Why? Because they added to it. Right. Nowhere in the whole law does it say you have to wash your hands before you eat. And it was a rabbinic tradition that if your hands were dirty, even if you ate clean food, that somehow that became unclean food because your hands were dirty. Now, you're adding to my word. And Jesus told them, well, why do you with your traditions transgress the law? What law did they break? Boom. Right here. God is not like man tampering with his word. Can you just leave it alone and let it be? Right. Father knows best. Okay? I'm not saying you're going to go to hell if you eat a rib sandwich. Okay? That's not what I'm saying here. There are sins that are, that are against your own flesh. And there are sins that are against God. Okay? <clears throat> By poking needle, I don't know, go get a tattoo or something crazy. In, in, in memory of mom, I have not sinned against the Lord. I've broken his word, but I have not sinned against him. I've sinned against my flesh. It's still a sin. I'm not saying here that we should be sinning at all. It's still a sin. Okay? We're told not to do it. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. <clears throat> this is our king speaking. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not coming to destroy it. That Greek word there means to bring to a halt. Right. I'm not bringing it to a halt. And I don't care what disciple that comes after Christ that you might think are bringing the law to a halt. My king said he wasn't bringing it to a halt. But coming to fulfill. And if you look at that Greek word in the Strong's Concordance, it means to fully teach or to fill up, to expound on. And then look at it. He goes right into Whoso there breaks one of the least of the commandments. And shall teach men so. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I'm not about to sit here and teach you that it's okay to eat something unclean. I'm sorry, that's not going to be on my hands. Right. Even if it is the least of them. The least of them. That's not one of the big ones. Let's be real. If I was to go out and stab somebody in the face, that's a big thing. Somebody, a bite of shrimp, that's not, I'm sorry. That's what, you can't even compare the two. But nonetheless, the Lord told you to, to abstain from it. Otherwise, you make your soul abominable. And if Jesus ain't doing away with the law, then, then what's going on? Why are we here? Why is Christianity where it is? <clears throat> Remember, Deuteronomy 4.22. I mean, 4.2. You cannot add to it or take from it. Let's move on. 1 Corinthians 10. We're going to go over some of the arguments that are used for this so we can get a little better understanding. And once this information is presented to y'all, y'all do it what you will. <laughs> 24 through 28. It reads, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles or in the butcher shop, Laddie, asking no question, 
for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any man, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, an unbeliever bid you to go and eat with them, and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake, that showed it, and for the conscience sake of that person. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Let's keep it in its context. 28 was the context. Paul's not telling you to sit down and break the law. What he is saying is, once that person's made it known to you, I don't care if it is clean. If you find out it's been offered to, a, 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 to an idol, halal meat, y'all ever heard of it? Yeah. Right? What is it? That's the meat that they... Pray or worship up to a God to before they serve out. Islam, Islam does this. Right? The Muslims do it. Now I believe they think they're worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they are not worshiping Christ, and that is their God, which is just God in the flesh. If you know it's halal meat, you probably shouldn't eat it. Because the Lord was telling them way back at Noah and then in the book of Acts. If you find out it's been offered to a sacrifice, well, Lord, who cares? It's lamb. And it tastes good. No, leave it alone. This is crazy. I know. It's probably not something Christians would even think to do in the New Testament. In this age. But he don't change, folks. He's the same yesterday. He was the same in Noah's day. He's the same in the book of Acts. And he's the same right now. He does not change. Either you believe that or you don't. Either he's a liar or he isn't. Paul is not teaching you otherwise according to the definition of Jesus Christ, our King. If you're teaching men to break the least of the commandments and do so, then you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And I can promise you that in the three and a half year ministry of Yeshua, never, not one time did he tell them it was okay to break the law. Not one time. Otherwise, he'd be the least in his own kingdom by his own definition. Okay? Let's go to 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. <clears throat> now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth, which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Oh, wow. Now I've got a problem on my hands. Sounds like we're good to go to me, right? Sounds like we're good to go. <clears throat> you got to ask yourself this question. Is Paul teaching you to break the law? No. Because if that's the case, I mean, they started tearing heads off almost for people that were teaching you to break the law. Something as simple as circumcision, they almost went to war over Trust me, they are not here to the point where they're just slamming whatever they want to eat just because I need to bless it, give thanks, and it's good to go. If the Lord said it was unclean, just because you pray over it, did that make it clean? Is God going to cleanse something he already declared to be unclean? Because if he can do it with food, he can do it with a relationship. An unclean union between a man and a man. He declared that to be unclean, abominable. Mm -hmm. So is God in the blessing business of something that he already declared unclean? Not if he doesn't change. But if you read in another place, Paul is talking about you got Scythians. You got these pagans coming into the faith that were straight up vegetarians. And y'all remember this. Uh you know, if you come into a place, don't destroy your brother with your meat who eats only herbs and is weak in the faith. For the Lord died for him too. Don't offend your brother with your meat. 
if he's a vegetarian, a vegan, and he thinks you shouldn't be eating any meat to abstain from all meats, not only that, but they would forbid to marry. You're allowed to marry? What do you mean? But these pagans would come into the faith thinking that if they denied themselves in this life, in their pagan system, this is what they would believe. If you deny yourself in this life, you'll gain it in the afterlife. And not only that, we should not be harming animals in this life. Listen, man, nothing new under the sun. We still got these people. We still got vegans telling you not to. Oh, do you know, Mama, even to this day, you get these ultra uh, vegan people. And I've met a couple. You shouldn't drink milk. Well, why not? Because human beings are the only people that continue to drink milk. No animals drink milk after they've grown up. You ever heard this argument? Yeah. yeah. I sat with one in prison. Everybody sitting there slamming milk. He's looking at us all crazy. We're like, what is going on with you? He starts breaking it down. I mean, there's some people out there so bad that you should not be pulling on the udders of a cat. It's hurting them. Or you should not interrupt a bee's nest for honey. And yet the Lord said, I'll give you a lamb flown with milk and honey. Hold that out. What about the cheeseburger? <laughs> Don't eat a cheeseburger. Cause... Cooking a kid in its mother. Yeah. So I'm under the impression that Paul, who was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, I'm using his words, he said that. They know the word. Right. He knows the law. Right. He knows that the Lord declared over 40 times that things were unclean. Paul knows this. But watch this. This is really wild. If we go to Romans 14, 14. So no, I don't believe Paul is telling you it doesn't matter what it is that's set in front of you. Just bless it and, 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 and chow it down. What he is saying, and if I can, I wish I could do this, and I feel safe doing this, because I know Paul not teaching us to break the law. Jesus Christ never taught it. He never taught any of his disciples. And his disciples did not teach these disciples to break the law. What Paul is saying is that if anything that is acceptable offered before you, don't even ask for conscience sake whether whether or not this thing is offered to an idol. Don't even ask. It's just because if you don't know, you won't be held accountable for it. Right. But if you find out that person like, oh, by the way, we we sacrificed this unto uh, uh, Krishna, whatever. You'd be like, come on, you had to say it, man. I'm hungry too, bro. <laughs> you couldn't have just Shh. and don't ask. If you're hungry, you, you find out it's been offered to an idol. You've got to pass it up. That's all there's to it. wonder how many Christians would do that today. Would pass it up. Oh, that's so nice. Romans 14, 14. I know, this is Paul. I know and am persuaded by the Lord. Hey, listen to this. I know and I'm persuaded. By the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is nothing, nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Wow. He knows and he's persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is the word? Who said I'm not coming to do away with? You cannot ignore a slew of other scriptures and come to this point. Peter even says that Paul says some things that are hard for us to understand. And people are twisting his words to their own destruction. Now watch this. Paul just got done saying nothing. He's persuaded and he knows nothing is unclean of itself. If we go to 2 Corinthians 6.17... It reads, and this is Paul again, by the way. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Well, what is it? You just got done saying nothing's unclean. Now you're telling us to, now you're quoting the Lord and telling us not to touch the unclean thing.
Oh, Lordy. Again, you're talking to a bunch of pagans coming into the faith. And if it's your <coughs> paganism, things were considered unclean, listen, have at it then. But just know this, when we come into this faith, we've already been told what things are unclean and unclean. I mean, clean and unclean. But if you want to, and that's unclean to you, fine. To him who esteems it to be unclean, then let it be unclean to him. Second of all, I can care less what you deem to be unclean or clean. If the Lord said it was, and he esteemed it to be unclean, what does it matter what a man says? When did that happen? Because if that's the case, and you can start doing it with one thing, and we can start breaking Deuteronomy 4 to and adding to and taking from. Once you open the silly door, now you can start deeming anything to be clean that God declared to be clean. Paul is not doing that here. You've got to get the concept, I mean the context of who he's talking to. At what time? He's talking to Romans coming into the faith. People in uh, Corinth coming into the faith. And not only that, but these people that were coming into the faith, they were like, no, you shouldn't eat any meat. Clean or not? But he said, you know something? We've got a liberty. We know what's up. We know what we can eat and what we can't. We, God's given us a list. But don't destroy your brother for me, over me, whom Christ died for. If it's going to offend him that you're biting into this massive cheeseburger and, and, and just juice is running out of this thing, and that's going to offend your, your vegan brother? Don't do it! It's that simple. And we can apply this principle to a lot of places. If you know, and you've got the liberty to drink a glass of wine, have a shot of strong drink, I don't know. If you know you've got the liberty to do that, and you think it might offend somebody and throw them off, use wisdom. Don't do it. Okay? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so, it looks to me that Paul is either bipolar or contradicting God's word who said some things are unclean. Or, as Peter says in uh, 3, 15 and 16, Paul, he's wrote some epistles to you guys before. And some of the stuff he says is hard to understand. Even to the point where people are twisting his words to their own destruction. Not once. Not once did these men of God teach or learn from their Messiah that it was okay to start changing the law. Not one time. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> I will say this. Let's read uh, Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, y'all are familiar with the story? Uh, Peter's up on a rooftop in Joppa. Yeah. And he's starving. The Bible says he goes into a trance, probably because he was hungry. And he sees this vision. The Lord shows a vision of a sheep that comes down from heaven and it covers everything. Every creeping thing Every clean thing, just every beast of the earth, it just covers it. And the Lord says to Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Kill and eat. You all know what Peter said? You all know? You all remember? What did he say, Mom? He said he's never had any unclean thing in his mouth in all of his life, and he was a good student. Right. Paraphrase. Right. He said, Lord, I've never had anything unclean. Or come and touch my lips. Let's go there. Let's go to Acts chapter 10. I want you all to see something. It took me years to see this. I think it's pretty cool. Who? No, not, not for this. We're, we're just chasing a rabbit here. Which is unclean. <laughs> I'm messing with y'all. Okay. So the Lord does this, and the Lord does this multiple times. I think he does it two or three times. At least twice, I think he does it three times. And in verse 13, in Acts chapter 10, verse 13, And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything, watch this, 
that is common or unclean. Two things here, he said. Common or unclean. Watch the Lord's response. This was done thrice, three times, and the vessel was received up into heaven. While Peter, behold, arise, and he wrote, Lord, help me out here. That was in the beginning. Okay. Peter said, not so Lord, common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, call not thou common. Notice unclean was not mentioned. He said, I've never ate anything common or unclean. But the voice said to him, What I have cleansed, call not thou common. Not unclean. Because God does not cleanse what he already deemed to be unclean. There was a thing back then, the common, which I, if I'm correct, somebody correct me on this if I'm wrong, but if it was handled by Gentiles or sold in the marketplace by Gentiles, which were considered unclean people, even if the food was clean, you're not to touch it because it was common or unclean. Now here's the issue. Do y'all remember when Jesus went to the woman at the well? And he sends his disciples up. Y'all go get some food. I'm going to go this way. And he goes to the well, and he meets this lady, and she comes out. And he says, woman, give me something to drink. What's her first response? How do you, being a Jew, have dealings with me? It's, it's, it's a tradition here. Y'all ain't even supposed to be talking to us. Why? Because the Jews call these people common, unclean people. Okay? Is the Lord violating the law? Is this in the law? As long as these people are, are trying to be in covenant with the Lord, they can live amongst you. Not only can you talk to them, they can live amongst you. And surely you're allowed to talk to these people. How aren't you going to win them to the Lord? But this was a, a tradition that was not of the word. So we know the Lord will never break the law. One, he can't. Otherwise, he's not the perfect lamb. He's not the sinless Messiah. There is no law forbidding the Lord to talk to this woman. It was a tradition. And then we see in the book of Acts, whom the Lord said, Peter, I give you the keys. Isn't that what he told Peter? Yeah. I give you the keys. Do you know that every time the Holy Ghost was given, that Peter was there every single time? He was there at the day of Pentecost when it was given first to the Jews. He was there in Samaria when they had got filled with the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible says up until this point, they were only baptized. But Peter had to come. He had to be there for them to get the Holy Ghost. Because the Lord said, I'm giving it to you. Keys of the kingdom. You're going to unlock it so that it can go out into the world. And here we are roughly, and this is history, 10 to 15 years after the cross, no Gentile has gotten the Holy Ghost. And the Lord is trying to do away with a tradition here in Acts chapter 10. It has nothing to do with food. The gospel is being hindered by, to go into the Gentiles, or at least the Holy Ghost, the kingdom. Why Peter? Of all the men that the Lord sent an angel to Cornelius in his household, he said, send for a man named Peter. It had to be Peter. It could not be another disciple. It could not be another apostle because the Lord needed Peter in peace. So Peter was there when the, and, and this is what the Lord said, you'll be witnesses unto me in here, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Peter was there for these two. Now he's got to be here for the uttermost parts of the earth, the Gentile world. It had to be Peter, folks. And the Lord was saying, you guys are still stuck on a stupid tradition of man by not going into the household of a Gentile. I thought I taught y'all something back when I visited this lady at the well. And not only that, that was the first person he ever revealed himself to was Messiah. It was a Gentile woman. How's that for your tradition? So then here we are, and the gospel, the Holy Ghost is not getting to these people, and the Lord says, you know what? Rise, slay, and eat. Absolutely not. What are you talking about? Didn't Jesus say, my sheep know my voice? Sure did. Peter knew it was the Lord. He said, not so, Lord. 
He knew who it was talking to him. And if the Lord had ever taught his disciples in three and a half years of ministry that it was okay to start doing this, don't you think they'd have been doing it by now? Notice Peter still. Because Jesus Christ never taught these people, his disciples, that it was okay to start doing these things. That's why still, Peter is still saying, absolutely not, nothing. Nothing has ever come across. What? How is it the Spirit is contradicting the Word and he has a conflict in himself while he's going to Cornelius' household? The angel says, Peter, get up, go. you got to go to this household. So he's going. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 10, we're not going to read it for the sake of time, while he's on the way, he's troubled in himself. Why? Because the Spirit is seemingly telling him to do something that the Word does not permit. Can I tell you, please folks, learn something about your God. He will never tell you to do anything in contradiction to the Word. He will never do it. And this is why Peter's struggling. And he finally gets to Cornelius' household. And I like this response. I want to read this. <clears throat> okay. In verse 25, And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. <laughs> but Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in. And found many that were come together. They were about to have church. Oh boy, hallelujah. Y'all understand what the Lord was about to do here. And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful lawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has shown me. Here you go. It's not about food. Y'all ready? But God has showed me not to call any man common or unclean. And this tradition of a man was keeping the Holy Ghost from going to Gentiles. God gave Peter the keys. Here you go. Okay, now it's time to unlock the kingdom of God fully for the Gentiles. It had to be Peter every time. And once that was it, it was a rat. Everybody started getting a Holy Ghost in the Gentile world. Well, how do we know it was the first Gentile? Because it says, and they of the circumcision that came with Peter were astonished. Because also the Holy Ghost was poured out on the Gentiles. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And Peter ends up saying, can any man here, after witnessing that the Lord just filled them with his Holy Ghost, and they got it the way we got it, can anybody here forbid that they be baptized? And they were all like, obviously we can't. And they had church. Okay? That whole thing is not about food. It's about getting rid of a tradition so that the gospel could go to the Gentile world. Hope y'all see that. Isaiah 66. And this is the one that messed me up, folks. So I apologize if this messes you up. But I'm, I've got a duty here. I, it's, it's my job to just give you what I got. Y'all do it what you will. What'd you say? Isaiah 66, we're going to start at 15. Please read the chapter when you get a chance. It's a lovely chapter. It is about the kingdom of God in the earth. It is about his second coming. Read it. New heavens and new earths are being created. All this other stuff. 66 is about his second coming. I'll prove it. You ready? For behold... The Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Did the Lord kill anybody in his first coming? There was no anger. I mean, there was a little bit of righteous indignation, but there wasn't no fury. No judgment was with being executed. There was no slain of the Lord. He was not... Catching bodies yet, okay? He will in a second come. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. They that sanctify themselves, and they that purify themselves, and the guardians behind one tree in the mix. This is talking about a false worship system, pagans. 
eating swine's flesh and the abomination, remember the things that come out of the water, and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. For in other words, in the thoughts, it shall come to pass that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Now this is just me, folks. When I read that, I couldn't get away from it. I'm not trying to be on the receiving end of any kind of judgment. Especially not for eating swine's flesh. Listen, this, I'm just giving you the word, man. Right. So, I played it safe with a lot of traditions of man. Uh, and, and some of the women here have too. Mama, right? We played, played along with the traditions of, of religion that weren't even scriptural. I'm giving you reasonable scripture here, logical answers that keep God as an unchanging God and his word true and unchanging. I just, me personally, I'm going to play it safe. It was hard for me. Y'all got your own little thing you guys got to do now. That's on y'all. I will say this, and this is kind of funny, in Revelation 18, 2. Uh, the next one, yeah. This is John. This is the one that was at the cross. This is the one that leaned into his bosom on Passover. And he cried mightily. He's the one writing Revelation. And he cried with a mighty, mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and of the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. If we're doing an array with unclean animals, why is he still calling them unclean? Y'all see what I'm saying here? Even 60 years after the cross, these men, Peter, I can promise you, Peter never walked away from that vision thinking it was okay to eat food that was unclean. He got the revelation. I'm not the called man. God was showing him something. It was a weird analogy. It messed Peter up. It messes Christians up today. But can we just get the same revelation and understand it wasn't about food, it was about man. That's all, that's it. And Peter never walked away from that vision eating unclean. So Yeshua didn't. He never taught his disciples. I'm just saying it would be wise to walk in our master's footsteps. Okay? That's all that's it. The only perfect human being ever to walk this planet set an example. You will not go wrong following it. That's where I'm at with it. Okay? Let's move on. Holidays. <clears throat> We're not going to take long. What culture is this? What's coming up? Wait a minute. That's like this Sunday, yeah? That's tomorrow. Woo! Yes! Strong drink. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm messing with y'all. <laughs> All right, that's an Irish thing. Next. American thing. Oh, well, now it is. But, you know, they try to pin it on a... Well, they, 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 never, they, they never did that in, in Ireland. No, 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 no. But it was based on a, an Irish man. But it is an Irish yes. In this country. Yes, yeah. you're right, you're right. Chinese New Year. All right, Chinese New Year. What culture is that? Day of the Dead. Mexican. What? That's a long. This is India or Indonesia. Indonesia. That's to that Buddhist stuff. All right, we know what cultures these are, right? Right. Yeah. Now let me ask you something. Can you back that up one, dear? I don't care what holiday that is. And what holiday? Exactly. There's a difference here. We're not out there worshiping fireworks. I, I, I could care less about fireworks on 4th of July. But there's nothing wrong with the 4th of July. This there is something, July. however, wrong with this. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Because you can't see the island of the Can you back it up another? And the one you told you can't there is something wrong with this. Yeah. Not all holidays are pagan, man. I get it. I personally, me, this is where I'm at. I personally don't mind celebrating them. Same time, I don't know how you celebrate it, but whatever. If y'all want to, you know, have a glass of ale or whatever, do what you do. Do it in moderation. Don't go sinning. Come on now. You want to be on Fourth of July? You want to throw some sparklers or something? You light some whatever. Do you? We're not. This this isn't stemming from false worship. You right. see what I'm saying? Right. Okay. Now, now watch this. Even if it is. In worship to the true God. There are elements of, I'm just going to say it, Christmas. 
there are elements of Chris, Christmas, even the date, mm -hmm. comes from a false worship system. Right, right. So I could care less, if you could go back one more, I can care less if in their minds they're, they're, they're thinking of God. No. Yehovah. Mm -hmm. You're still breaking commandments. I don't care where your heart's at. Yeah. You're still breaking commandment number one and two. Idols. One, two, and three. So it doesn't matter. Can we Intentions. Can we just get the intentions out of the way? Right. We hear people say it. We've heard it preached. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right? There's some truth right. to that. There's some truth to that. God is not worried about your intentions. What about when David was trying to bring the ark back? Mm -hmm. And that high priest that was, oh, well, he wasn't the high priest. He, that's, that's the thing. He wasn't ceremonial, ceremonially clean to touch the ark when it went to go fall off the wagon. And the Lord was like, oh! oh sorry, dude. But you had to hold that out. You were not allowed to touch that. The man's intentions were, you can't get better in touch. Oh my God, the ark. He loved it. He, he wanted to protect it. What an awesome intention. It doesn't get any more pure. But the Lord had to whack him because he was breaking the law. He wasn't clean. He wasn't ceremonially clean to do it. Okay? What about Samuel? Not Samuel, uh, Saul. Mm -hmm. Samuel told him, Chief, just wait for me before y'all go to war. Don't make no sacrifice. We'll do it when I get here. And here the Philistines are, gaining ground, gaining ground, day after day, day after day. And Sam Saul is like, we got to go. We can't wait much longer. Where is Samuel at? Where's the prophet of God at? We need to make a sacrifice. We need to go to war. He didn't even want to go to war, bro, until he made a sacrifice to God. That is good intentions as far as I'm concerned. But he did break it, and he sacrificed himself. He made the sacrifice. It was the prophet. It was the man of God's job, not a king, to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And Samuel shows up like, Jesus, what did you do? What are you talking about? You should have waited. The Lord obviously told Samuel what had happened on, on the way. You messed up. And for that reason, the Lord's going to strip the kingdom from you and give it to another. Mm -hmm. Good intentions. I don't care why you celebrate paganism. Okay, we've got enough biblical examples. What about uh, one more? I'll give you one more. Moses up on the mountain getting the commandments. Uh, Aaron, they're down there, and the people are like, well, where's this man at? We need to do some worshiping around here. And they said, tomorrow we'll make a feast unto the Lord. It was unto the Lord. They defaulted to an Egyptian worship system, made a calf, but it was still unto the Lord. That's what they said. That's what the word says. Tomorrow we will make a feast unto Yehovah. Good intentions. But while it's going on, the Lord's like, Moses, get off this mountain. I'm going to start killing people. Why? What's up? Just get down. Go. Moses sees what's going on. <gasps> start smashing the tablets. He was ticked. Yeah. Righteous indignation. He had every right to be ticked. Mm -hmm. But the Lord was like, Chief, I made the first tablet. You broke them. You're going to have to make the second set. You broke my tablets. You're going to have to hold that on and make the second one. But it still had to be the finger of God that wrote it on both. Okay? <coughs> so, let's fast forward. Right there. Yeah, there you go. We know what culture that is. All right? That almost ties in with the Day of the Dead. All Saints Day. Let's make it religious. Put a little bow on it and make it okay. Trunk or treat. <laughs> Let's trunk or treat. Yeah. Let's do it on the 31st of October. You got the whole fall, 90 days, to reach out to your community and you just have to do it on, the, on this day. Man, the early church would have a field day with us. They'd be laying hands on us, all right. Next one. What culture is that? All right, I'm going to get it. I, I laid this out today. It's not something we're going to be doing all the time. But I put this out. You know the, uh, help me out here. Talit. Talit. 
the shofar, the seven candlesticks mentioned in Revelation, the, the, the menorah in Leviticus. We know what this is a culture of. Does not mean we are trying to be Jewish. It is, however, us trying to get familiar with the culture of his kingdom. Which is, happens to be very Jewish. You don't think so? Well, in the millennial reign, Zechariah 14, read the whole chapter. That whole chapter is about the millennial reign of Christ. His feet hitting the Mount of Olives. An earthquake happening, splitting the mountain, right? I've even heard Bishop from the last church I went to teach on this. Zechariah 14 is without a shadow of a doubt talking about the second coming of the Lord, him establishing his kingdom in the earth. Well, read the whole chapter, folks. I wish they'd keep reading the whole thing. Because at the bottom of it says all the families of the earth that don't come to worship for the Feast of Tabernacles. It will not reign in their land. You don't think this kingdom is, has a culture? It sure does. It demands modesty, right? Hello? Yes. Some modesty. Yes. A man should look like a man, act like a man, not play the role of a woman. A woman should look like a woman, play the role of a woman. Modesty on both ends. There's holidays in this Bible that were given to us. Every last one of them point to Jesus Christ and his fulfillment of these. Some are yet to be fulfilled, the fall feast. Mm -hmm. We said this last week, bro, you missed it. I'm just going to throw it out there for you. On the Feast of Sukkot, for that week of celebration, they would slaughter 70 bulls over that week period. And that was for the 70 nations of the earth. Why? Because it was a time at Sukkot where we could come and celebrate and learn to celebrate and fear the Lord in a festival. A literal party. Literal party. You're partying for a week here. So God's not against partying. It's against moderation. But that the whole earth, even the Gentiles, would one day come in covenant. The whole earth would come in covenant with the Lord, and it will during his reign. And that, I believe, is why we keep the Feast of Tabernacles for that whole thousand years. Because it's being fulfilled in the era that it was intended to be fulfilled in. Does that make sense? So this kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord, does have a culture. It has a menu. Okay? That none of the disciples thought it was Okay? And if you read Paul in his context, he's talking about even clean meats that were being forbidden by these beings. Even No meat, none at all, even the clean stuff. So do y'all with this? Y'all understand the kingdom of God has a culture. Yes. Yes. All right. It has a dress code, has holidays. It has uh, a menu. Some other things we could talk about. But uh, I just wanted y'all to see this today. Y'all, anybody got any questions? We can go a little further. I had a couple more scriptures here. Deuteronomy 18.9. Let's talk about these holidays for just a second. Deuteronomy 18.9. When you are coming to the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. Jeremiah 10.2. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the sight of the heavens, for the heathens are dismayed at death. We're not going to go any further than that. So when the Lord was driving these nations out, and he was using Israel to execute judgment in the earth, I'm giving you a land, and on the way, if anybody gets in the way, we're driving them out. And here's the reason I'm driving them out. Because of their abominations. Because of these things. So when I'm driving them out, you're not supposed to go in there and inquire and ask them, how do you serve your gods? How? When do you serve your gods? What are some of the rituals? And then say you're going to do it unto the Lord. Not going to happen, Jack. He wants no part of it. You cannot take a part of a false worship system and put a stain on God with that. Do you see what I'm saying? And actually it puts a stain on your own garment. And he's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And this is why the Lord's telling us in Revelation 18.4, come out of her, my people. We're not to learn these things. 
So I'm going to say it like this. The first person who learned to celebrate Jesus Christ on a winter solstice. Winter solstice is December 23rd. Why two days? Why December 23rd? Because it's when the sun starts to barely become noticeably longer in the sky. And they would declare the rebirth of the sun god, the resurrection, or the rebirth of the sun god. When the days start to get longer. And time epiphanies in, I want to say, 368 or 468, I think, uh, when at the uh, destruction of the first temple, when he desecrated it. He didn't destroy it, he desecrated it. Slaughtered a pig on the altar. Set up the statue of Zeus. And declared him to be God on December 25th. Declared his birthday to be December 25th. <coughs> I'm not saying all gods are December 25th. But we know of another one, Tammuz, in Ezekiel, where the women are weeping for Tammuz, supposedly December 25th. So you can see elements of a faith, false system coming into the faith. And the Lord never intended you to mix seed. Right. We know physical seed mentioned, but we can take that quite uh, the aspect spiritually, too. All right, anybody got any questions? Any comments? We are good to go. <laughs> Who's going home and throw out the bacon? <laughs> I got bacon. 